Welcome to a very special archived edition of People of the Free Gift Teaching Through the Bible. And that means it could range anywhere from current day to 10 years ago. And so this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. And we're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and enable notifications so you won't miss any of our teachings through the Bible, which we release at least once a week and many times several times a week. And so we're so glad that you joined us. How many of you like to look at pictures? How many of you enjoy a good movie, a good drama? How many of you realize that God does too? And in fact, um, he has taken the efforts to orchestrate history, and especially the history of his people Israel, in such a way as they would be acting out future events. And particularly, they'd be acting out future events that are in relation to the coming of the Messiah, the one that God had promised who would take away the sins of the world. And today, what I wanted to do, um, as we've been looking for at the reasons why we believe in Jesus, we spent a couple of weeks talking, or we spent a week talking about why we believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And last week we started talking about this thing called prophecy. The idea that God would declare beforehand, in some cases several hundred years, or even a thousand years or more in advance, the events that were going to take place in the future. And that he would do so with 100% accuracy, which is the standard that he set for himself. Well, last week we looked at a, a specific type of prophecy, and that is the propositional statement type of prophecy, where God just comes right out and he says, this is going to happen this way. That's either a hit or miss type of prophecy. That's where you know that it's prophecy. But there's another type of prophecy that flows throughout the entire narrative, the entire story of the Old Testament. And that is the type of prophecy where they are, there's real historical events that are taking place, but in the way that they are happening, and especially in the way that they are recorded for us and edited by the Holy Spirit in the text, they are foreshadowing of things that would happen later. One of the pictures that we're going to look at a little later um, in the very text that Ernie just read for us, Jesus points back to one of the pictures that we're going to look at, a bronze, or a, a bronze serpent up on a pole. What is that all about? And so Paul tells us about this different type of prophecy in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Paul is taking the Corinthian church through a journey in the Old Testament, and particularly a lot of these happening in Exodus and Numbers, where God's people are brought up out of Egypt, out of slavery, and they pass through the Red Sea, and then later through the Jordan River, where the waters part. And then they follow the presence of God by a cloud by day and fire by night. And Paul takes that event and he, sa he says that the nation of Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. That that was a picture of baptism. 
And then, as they're in the wilderness, God's providing spiritual food and drink for them, and real tangible manna that falls from the sky. And the people get thirsty one day, and they start complaining. And so Moses goes to God and says, God, what should I do? God says, go to this rock that I will show you and hit it as hard as you can, and water will come gushing out. Well, that happened a couple of times. He was only supposed to hit the rock the first time. And then he was supposed to speak to the rock the second time, and he got in big trouble because he hit the rock the second time. But Paul takes that event and he says that rock that was smitten was Christ. And God was having Moses act out prophecy by smiting the rock and it would gush forth living water that would provide for the needs of the people. Well, down in verse 11, he says, these things happened to them, the Israelites, as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Now this word examples, we think of an example as something that somebody's trying to show us how to do something, or show us what not to do in this case, right? They complained, or they rebelled, and so different things happened to them, and that's what he, he's talking about. But this word example, is, it's not really our word example. It's a different word. How many of you remember typewriters? <laughs> How many of you remember using typewriters? By the way, I'm included in this. So don't, <laughs> don't exclude me. But how many of you are grateful that we don't have to rely on typewriters anymore? Okay. I'm very grateful for the backspace key on my computer. Well, a typewriter, the way that it worked was you'd hit the key that corresponded with the letter that you wanted. And then what would happen? Yeah, the little, little thing that would, on the paper, and it smacked it, and it left the, it left the letter that you wanted. And that, the reason why it's called a typewriter is because of this word that was used. It's a type. Paul says that these stories were a type of what was to come. Now, what is a type? It is a mark that's left by a blow. And that's why it's called a typewriter. You hit the key, the thing slams down on the paper, and it leaves a P or a Q, whatever letter you want it. And that's what he says these stories are, is that they're stories that leave a mark, an imprint of something that is going to come. And we're going to take a look at three of these stories that do just that. And the first of them is in Genesis chapter 22. And so if you have your Bibles or if you have a sanctuary Bible in front of you, it's on page 31. The words will also be up here, but I really want you guys to see it. It's really there. Abraham and Isaac. Now, as you're following along in the story of Genesis, God calls this man Abraham, and he says, I want you to leave your family, leave your country, leave everything behind, and go to this place I'm going to show you. And through your offspring, all the nations are going to be blessed specifically talking about the Messiah going to come from his family. Well, problem. Abraham can't have kids. Him and his wife, Sarah, try and try and try, and they can't have kids. How is God going to fulfill this promise? Well, they try and take matters into their own hands, and Abraham has a servant, and he has relations with her, and they have a kid. And he thinks, okay, now I have a kid. Now he, I can have descendants, and the, the promise can go forward. And God says, that's not the one. I have a kid that I'm going to give you with Sarah. And a year from now, he's going to be here. And Abraham believes the promise. And sure enough, a year later, Isaac is born. The miracle child. And Abraham was about 100 years old at that point. So, great time to have kids. 100 years old. <laughs> 
hard enough for me at 28. <laughs> well, the years go on, and Abraham has his son Isaac. And scholars say that Isaac wasn't probably just wasn't a little boy when this event that we're going to read about took place. He may have been around 30 years old. He may have been fully grown. And God says this to Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And I want you to see that in this event, we specifically have God initiating what was going to take place. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, Abraham must have been quite familiar with the voice of God at this point. Because I don't know about you, but if this was me, if I thought that I heard the voice of God telling me to sacrifice my son, I would have said, nah, that couldn't have been him. As you go on to read the Old Testament, one of the things that God is adamant about, do not sacrifice your children like all those other people do over there. That's not what you are to do. But here he commands Abraham to do just that. What, what is going on? And Abraham must have been thinking the same thing. Or was he? Well, God says, your only son, Isaac. And this is one of the instances when I talked about the Holy Spirit editing the text in such a way that it's, it's to fulfill prophecy. This isn't technically true. Isaac is not his only son. He has another son named Ishmael that we already talked about, how he came about. But the son Isaac was the son of the promise. And God says, give up your only son. Now there's something going on here beyond the text. And then we go... To this, he says, go to this place called Moriah, this mountain Moriah. And if you were to read, to read Jewish sources, they would tell you this is where the temple was in, eventually built. And yes, it is on that mountain, but it's not at the peak of the mountain. What I have on the screen is a topographical map of Mount Moriah. And if you go to the peak of Mount Moriah, you come to a place that had a different name in the time of Christ. And that name was Golgotha the place where Jesus would be crucified. And so what is going on here? You have God commanding Abraham to offer up his only son, Isaac, whom he loves, the child of the promise. Verse 3 through 5. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. He doesn't waste any time. Early the next morning, saddles up his donkey, gets his servants together, let's go. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Catch this. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, Abraham's either trying to not let his servants in on what's going on, or, or something else is going on. He says to his servants, you stay here with the donkey. Isaac and I are going to go up this mountain, and we're going to make the offering, and then we will come back down to you. And notice that it happens on the third day. They've been out on this journey three days. Well, one of the things I want to encourage you about is if you're studying the Bible, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament has something to say about this particular detail. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, 
it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned. Now I said, I would be thinking this can't be God because he's telling me to sacrifice my child, the child of the promise. Abraham thinks in his mind. This is what he's thinking. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. What the writer of the Hebrews is saying is, from the moment that God gave Abraham the command to sacrifice Isaac, he was considered dead in Abraham's mind. How long did it take to get to the mountain? Three days. And so he's saying that Abraham offered up his only son Isaac and three days later received him back from the dead. Does that sound familiar? Verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Who's carrying the wood? Isaac. Verses 7 and 8. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, uh, the NIV and similar translations, they try and make the text as readable as possible. Because the original language, if you take it word for word, it's quite choppy, and the words aren't in the right order. And so it'd be quite hard for us to read in English. Some translations try and stick more to the literal word for word translation. Now, the NIV switched the word order around a little bit, and they inserted a word here. They inserted the little word for. And where they put it is they said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. In the Hebrew, it reads, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Now that's quite a detail. He was crucified on a cross of wood, and yet he made the hill on which it stood. God himself was on that cross. And the picture that's being painted tells the same. In verses 9 through 14, as the story goes on, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now this sounds a little bit more like the God that we, we know. We are, whew, okay, he didn't have him go through with it. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And in Hebrew, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And the what he names the place is, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Or in some translations it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What shall be seen? Well, I think we have quite a few details of what shall be seen. A father who would provide his only son as an offering for you and for me. The next pass, the next event is Passover. And that's in Exodus chapter 12. If you would turn there to page 104 in your sanctuary Bibles. 
And we know the story, or many of us do, that God's people, after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have, Jacob has 12 sons, and one of them's named Joseph. He gets sent down as a slave in Egypt, becomes second in command of all of Egypt, and then he invites his whole family to come down to Egypt as he provides for their, their needs during a famine. Well, then a pharaoh comes along who doesn't know about Joseph, and he enslaves the Israelites for 400 plus years. And then God hears their cries as they have reached a number in which they can come out as a nation. God tells them that he was going to deliver them. And he sends Moses down to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. And God brings a number of plagues, 10 in total. And on the day of the last plague, God tells his people to do something very specific. And in the New Testament, we're told that by Paul, get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. And in verse 5 of chapter 12 of Exodus, as God's going through the details of the feast that they are to eat during the night of this last plague, the feast of the Passover, he tells them that the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. In verse 46, it says it must be eaten inside one house. Take none of the meat outside the house and do not break any of the bones. And so we see the requirement is a lamb that had no fault, no blemish, or in human terms, no sin, and that not one of his bones, bones were to be broken. And Peter tells us, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. In verses 6 and 7, it tells us about those, the requirements to have the plague of death pass over the house. It says, take care of them, that is the, the Passover lambs, until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So they apply the blood of the lamb, and it's that which God sees and passes over them. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And John the Baptist proclaims, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now we have the third picture. In the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Does anybody recognize this symbol? Yeah. This is the symbol for the medical profession. Where'd that come from? Well, they would say it goes back to the Greek gods and stories, that the Greek god of medicine but they actually got the wrong symbol because the Greek god of medicine, Aesculapius, has one serpent, and the Greek god of commerce has two, so they accidentally picked the Greek god of commerce. <laughs> but where's this symbol really come from? Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 6. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. 
and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. I believe the book of Numbers could be called the book of complaining, because that's all they do, the entire book, and God keeps on trying to teach them the lesson of why you shouldn't complain. And in this case, the people complain, and God sends, sends venomous snakes to them. And so the people, you have a picture of the people being plagued because of their ingratitude and their rebellion against God. And then in verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So the people crying out for God's mercy when they're getting bitten with the plague because of their rebellion. Verse 8 and 9. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Now, does this sound strange to anybody else? These are odd instructions. They're very specific instructions. And by the way, wasn't there another serpent that was talked about in Scripture that wouldn't be such a great symbol for God to use? Or would it? Something that you need to be aware of and we went over this in the Wednesday night study, is that the Holy Spirit, when I talk about editing the text, I mean that he uses words and particular objects very specifically. And in this instance, we have an example of that. Jesus, in the text that Ernie read, said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, if you were to really take a concordance and, and track down the serpent, you would find that it's always used as a symbol of sin. You have the serpent in the garden talking to Eve, and you have serpents here and there, and it's always a bad thing, not to offend any of you who like snakes. But bronze it also seems to be used in a very particular way. As you read about the construction of the tabernacle and the temple, bronze seems to be a symbol of judgment. And so you have here a symbol of sin on a pole being judged. And so no wonder Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever looks at him and trusts in him will have eternal life. And I thought this would be a good time for us to sing a song that's familiar to us, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And so let's just sing that together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Those words, when you, you read this story, they immediately took me to the words of the song. That it, it is about us looking to Jesus. He is the symbol of our healing. He's the symbol of how we get eternal life. Well, let's just put these three pictures together, the pictures that God painted. He told us what was going to happen. A father, God, would offer up his only son, who we also found out was to be himself, 
as a sacrifice for sins. We're told also that the father would receive his son alive again after three days. Where was it going to happen? On Mount Moriah, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen, shall be provided. When it was going to happen? During the celebration of the Passover. How was it going to happen? The sacrifice for sins would be lifted up and exalted on a pole. The specifics of the one sacrifice. He must be a lamb without blemish, not one of his bones would be broken, and his blood was to be poured out. How would we be forgiven of our sins? When God sees the blood of the Lamb applied, he will pass over us in judgment. The righteous judgment of God upon sin would be poured out on his Son. And those that look to the symbol of God's judgment upon sin would be healed from the curse of their rebellion. That's quite, that's quite some amazing pictures that God has painted for us. And you know what? I would challenge any of you to find any story in the Old Testament that does not directly point to Jesus Christ. And if you just take that statement on face value, you fail. I mean it. Really look at the stories of the Old Testament is because behind every page you will find Jesus when you really look when you when you dig in you will find Jesus on every page and it's an amazing reality to discover this book that's in our hands is not just a human invention it is not a collection of fables or stories that give us some moral guidance and value to this life. It is not just to put a bright and shiny ray on the clouds when it's raining on us. It is written by God to us. And it has instructions of how we are to live this life. It tells us everything we need to know about him and his son it tells us everything we need to know about ourself. It is an amazing and wonderful book. Why do we believe in Jesus? Why would you not? Why would you not? And if you're looking for evidence and reasons to believe, I hope today that you found them. And if not, I hope that you at least take under consideration that there might be some validity to all of this, that you would continue and really ask the questions that are on your heart and on your mind, and don't give yourself peace until you settle them. Your eternity rests on your answers to the question of who is this Jesus. And so now